Welcome to The Gallery Date. I'm Jen Singer, founder of Jen Singer Gallery. Thanks for joining me for our weekly date to chat about art and life and perhaps the art of life, all in bite-sized, not at all fancy, but definitely savory episode nuggets. Let's mingle, my friends. Don't forget to press record, Jen. Well, hello, strangers. I have to say I've really missed our gallery date. So uh, before season two starts production this summer, I thought we should catch up and see how everyone's doing. Um, so what we've been up to is this month on jensingergallery.com, we launched Black Sun Braided Time, a virtual exhibition of German-British artist Marius von Brasch's oil paintings on linen and drawings on paper. Uh, Marius's work is very complex. It's as complex as it is, as it is beautiful. His paintings and drawings are emotional, expressionist, and full of movement and passion. The artist himself is kind, loving, gentle, and just one of the most interesting people that I've had the pleasure of meeting and talking with. Um, you know, it's one thing to see his work, but meeting Marius and learning about him and his work is altogether different in the best possible way. So that's why today I'm sitting down with him uh, to interview him from his Isle of Wight studio. So first, before we get started with that, I'll just give you a little bit of background on Marius. He is a German-British artist. He received his MA with distinction uh, from Winchester School of Art, University of Southampton, where he also completed his practice-based PhD. He was awarded the Abbey Fellowship in, in painting at the British School in Rome in 2013. And he has a background in psychotherapy and literature. He teaches experiential approaches to painting as well as courses on art and literature. His work is held in the Prizman Seabrook Collection, the University of Essex Modern and Contemporary British Art Collection, and is held in international private collections. The artist is a member of Contemporary British Painting and lives and works on the Isle of Wight in the United Kingdom. So without further ado, here we go. Here's my interview with Marius. Uh, I hope it gives you more insight to the artist himself and uh, how and why he creates his work. And um, please visit jumpsingergallery.com forward slash black sun to check out his current exhibition. All right, here we go. Here's my interview with Marius von Brasch. Hi, Marius. Welcome. It's so lovely uh, to see you today. How are you? <laughs> Hi, Jen. Thank you so much for inviting me for this interview. I'm fine. I'm prepared for this here in my studio. Ah, uh, good. Brilliant. Um, well, it's nice to see a peek inside your Isle of Wight studio. So why don't you start by giving us a little background information about you as an artist, you know, a, a bit more, a more extensive background than being an artist. Well, I started out as a child to love music and um, learned the piano and was quite obsessive with, obsessive with it, and mm -hmm. but had in mind to become a composer. And uh, I, I gave this idea up, um, probably puberty, because I thought this is not um, what I want to deliver, um, competition in the piano and, and so forth. I'd started to discover literature at this point. And uh, actual visual art started with me really just beginning 20s and it was a quite spontaneous experience um, with being left alone with pastels and big paper and then um, so, so something took over somehow and um, it, it, it was actually a really on, on some level really quite life-changing for me because after this experience I wanted to have that again that experience this uh, materiality of the pigments and, and so forth that I found fascinating and I wanted to go on with this. So um, I learned for many years actually through this intuitive process and um, in, uh, in, in parallel working with observational drawing to strengthen that. So the intuitive process got me um, working on what, what is called mark making, but I, I find this is a really very energetic and very, very um, nearly primal experience on some level. The passion is, is more in um, working from something I couldn't define what it really is. So I did a lot of research around, um, uh, I mean, taking myself as a kind of guinea pig, to, to find out what is this um, when, when one paints from within, 
Mm. And um, what is happening there? And uh, I mean, I come from a family where psychoanalysis was quite um, on the table. My father, my father was an analyst, and um, and these models of psychoanalysis have been for me um, not really uh, always very helpful. I found them in the end too restrictive. And um, but what I want to say is, so I had a long phase of self taught. Um, this in, in hindsight, this long phase to deal um, with with my own approach and with my own guidance from from something in me uh, has helped me to find my language in a certain way. So um, I did um, uh, do my training then later. I mean, my formal training in terms of I, I produced a, a book out of a series of monochromatic paintings, which um, dealt with this subject of Oedipus, and it was a mixture of quite serious and quite ironic images. Um, and this book saved me um, having to go for a long BA. So here in Britain, I went directly for the MA, and um, I, I did this in order to break my habits. So I, I did what is possible here in Britain, the practice-based PhD. It means half of my thesis is an exhibition, and half is a theoretical text, which I did um, with philosophical themes. So, um, and from then on, uh, that was uh, 2012, I did my, finished my PhD. From then on, I had um, become a committed uh, eight hour artist in a way. And I have in the meantime, I mean, I left this out, but it's important. Um, uh, through my own experiences, I went uh, into a training as a gestalt therapist and body therapist. So I've um, been working in psychotherapy for 14 years and gave this up 2007 in order to do only art. So this is, I did the psychotherapy in combination with um, offering workshops for um, finding your own traces, finding your own way of I mean, basically, to share my experience I had, but with people who were very insecure about their painting or felt they wanted to explore something completely different or, um, like myself, break break through some molds of how to paint and so on to, to free this up a bit. But, of course, for me, who, who I am now as an artist is a mixture of all of these things. So the intuitive bit has always stayed with me, and this is how I approach my work. But the um, knowledge I have gained and the formal training, formal ideas that are in my mind, and so they play a role in the end to make it more, uh, much more structured than when I started it. So when you first started painting, uh, it was actually large scale drawings that on paper yeah. that you worked on initially, yeah. and. Um, what was that experience like? And how you were quite young, you were in your early 20s, is that right? I felt it was overwhelming. This is why yeah. I said before um, that I, I wanted that again, because it was an experience of being really myself. Um, well, I just wanted to get an idea of, I wanted to picture where this happened in my head. Can you paint the picture? Uh, was this when you were living in Germany still? Were you already in England? I lived with a girlfriend together in Frankfurt, and um, we had a, a very short relationship and lived mm -hmm. together there. And she was an art student and gave me this um, this big sheet of, I mean, this big paper. And, and um, I mean, we, we our, our circle said that we're all into art and um, music or writing or whatever. And... Um, uh, it was on a wooden floor. Uh, she was very ang angry at me later because of all the pigments between <laughs> the walls. So yeah, I left a bad impression there. Um, <laughs> it wasn't uh, going to work out anyway. <laughs> no, it wouldn't work out. But um, I, I think still to her um, because uh, she that, that was a very cathartic moment for me. That mm. was when I, I really felt. I knew always I wanted to do art or music or so but this is where i where i felt i am now mm. and this is a really big difference isn't it yeah before exactly. education or whatever there were there were quite a lot of um obstacles in the way and um, 
Of course, there are always obstacles to come to a flow of creativity and also phases when it doesn't work and come back and this is ebb and flow one needs to trust into. But uh, I had enough time to learn that. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so when you were painting or drawing, uh, how what was the evolution of the mediums that you explored? Um, I... I started actually mainly with drawing, um, but I did. I mean, for me, these divisions are, have been always a bit questionable because I think that some of my drawings say are paintings in my mind, although they are, they are sparse. Um, and I started then with oil as well, and um, because I liked the smell and uh, the, the the kind of substance of these colors to touch them and to to work with my fingers on the um, on the canvas and so on. But I had to learn a lot in the beginning. So I, um, I mean, I, I, I slowly uh, worked and uh, learned this oil painting and later I did acrylics in between. And I got into oil painting because it gives me more time and I like slow art, also to look at art slowly. So for me, it's more suitable. It develops um, more uh, organically, I find, than with acrylic when it um, uh, dries very quickly. Mm. Whereas oil color is uh, gives gives you more more time. Yeah, um, and you're you've got a very um, academic style almost to your paintings, and it, not academic, but. Um, you give it time and space. You can see that in your work. Yeah. And, yeah, and... Um, I mean, all the details and stuff like that. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah this is these are formal concerns, I think, and also um, knowing more about what I really enjoy doing. Mm -hmm. So uh, I have a real love for uh, classical art. Um, I mean, and contemporary art, but um, it, it's mm -hmm. more... Um, Renaissance, Baroque, and then contemporary, what I really like. Mm -hmm. And um, I go often to the National Gallery and just sit there and look. And um, one of the painters I've learned most from is Poussin, Nicolas Poussin. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is about um, how, how, how do they structure a canvas? Because it's a space, it's a window, it's a theater space, or whatever one wants to call it. And um, uh, how can I... Um, invite the viewer, get the viewer on a journey mm -hmm. and enjoy the journey myself. But it is something I want to communicate. So it's not mm -hmm. only, um, I, I don't want to be, how to say, um, on stage on these paintings, but I want these paintings to um, talk as if they don't know they are observed. Mm. Yeah, so they build yes. their space themselves, and they they are they they might look sometimes um, as if the curtain opens in the theater, but none of the figures looks at you really. Yeah, I think. well, that brings me to um, another question that I um, wanted to ask you, which was your partner Mike. Uh, when he yeah. sees your paintings, he can hear. He says he can hear your paintings. Um, and I've had a similar reaction to your work, um, especially the piece in the Black Sun exhibition um, that's behind you, um, Pansy. Uh, we had a whole yeah. conversation when I first saw the work. Um, yeah. I felt like it was very musical, almost like operatic. Um, yeah, so I, the, the music, uh, I mean, music was my first love somehow. And I do, um, I mean, you said the formal and aspect, academic aspect also. Um, for me, it, I, I don't think myself it's academic. It's more like um, like built sometimes, I think, to string quartets often. And they are built in movements, and each movement has got a certain mood and certain mm -hmm. development and so on. And I like to um, have that my, my paintings have got a different quality um, to, to them, a different energy, different color theme. And still in the same size, so they work as like um, as a set often very well, I think. Mm. Um, 
Hang on, but you do you, uh, are about the, the the painting about Pansy? About yes, about uh, well, it was, it when I first a, saw it, I saw I I felt like it had a musical element to it, almost operatic, or it's very dramatic and it, uh, piece, and it has a lot of movement, which all of your work has a lot of energy and movement in it. Yeah. But yeah. Um, I would love to hear. Uh, I mean, you listen to music while you're painting. Was there no? I don't. I don't. Listen, I don't listen to them. I um, uh, for for me, they are very much about the flow. I want to. Um, I, I want to uh, mediate. I mean, to show mm. and experience while I paint it. But um, it needs to be structured in the same time. So for me, that's really important mm -hmm. to have a counterweight of. Um, the smooth and the straight, if one could say, you know, the the fluidity and the kind of um, segments that separate things and make it mm -hmm. possible to show different rooms. I mean, this this painting here, the the pansy painting, was for me a quite um, quite unusual experience. The the other one was for me very difficult to make. The subject of um, this one here was. Um, how do I bring together polarities? And um, th th this is very simple in painting cold colors, warm colors, light, darkness, and it's an old subject that is used in alchemy. Um, so, so how do I bring fire and water together, for example? Yeah, And um, as it is also a quality of feeling in myself and in other people, so it's, it's very much about the energies how do I bring together the watery energy um, with all its associations of feeling and depression and um, excitement and so on, and fire, which is drier and um, has the association of light and um, sometimes anger and so on. So um, I wanted to fuse them. And it was very difficult because of the color scheme. It, mm, it, uh, you're talking about echoing green specifically. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, because it, the other thing developed from that. This is uh, what, what I talk about. Okay, so, so pansy was a development after yeah. or during yeah. the development of I, I green. I prepared both canvases. Um, this one was green prepared and the other one was pink. So because in themselves there are polarities already. How do I, in, in the end, how will they work together? Mm. I, I'm not sure whether they work actually so well together, those two. They're too different. But okay, so I had this one took me very long, and the other one was very small, uh, very fast. And while painting, I suddenly realized this is what I paint there. This is how I felt as a child. Mm. Exactly, this is my world as a child. This painting, mm. and uh, normally I don't like to be personal in my paintings somehow, or, or I want always to go beyond my kind of twenty four seven life. And want to go something into something deeper that I share with other people as well, because I think it has got some something more to um, to communicate. But uh, I, I felt I need also to be really clear about this. This is the reason mm -hmm. why I called it pansy, because I was very sensitive as a child, and um, I had the experience that I uh, was told everywhere that it's wrong. And that I'm not a real boy, and then I was uh, bullied for a while, and this has deeply imprinted me. I'm mean, to be beaten up and not be able to fight back, and um, not understanding. I didn't mm. understand that, so I was a, a quite dreamy child, very uh, probably very imaginative. I guess uh, I was very perceptive for feelings, energies. I mean, basically very open, and this. Uh, uh, this experience of being um, bullied, I mean, of course, I was never called a pansy because I grew up in the German um, language and was never said like this. People were worried about me. They said, why don't you want to play with this? And why don't you want to play football and all of this stuff? Um, and then being bullied by other boys and to suddenly feel I'm attracted by other boys, you say homosexual and gay and all these words, but they were very non, this was all very non-verbal, but all mm -hmm. wrong. Let's say this is probably one of the most important um, personal experiences I had and that I bring into my work as well to question, I went to pose questions about what it means to be a man. Uh, 
calling this pansy self portrait mm-hmm. as a child is um to in a way it was a really good experience for me for me to have this as a last experience painting for the show as well coming up and I thought okay so I will um, put this out there in the show and with this title because I know that um, in, in English has, it has got a very strong connotation which emotionally I don't really feel but I right. like flowers I like yeah. pansies <laughs> so you're embracing <laughs> <And> I, it <laughs> I'm okay being called gay and homosexual and all of this is fine I have a, um, uh, this has been part of my development to be uh, uncomfortable with having to compartmentalize myself, although mm. my real life, one partner for over 30 years, so uh, I've made my decisions, obviously, yeah. but uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure whether this is really the best um, quality of our contemporary lives that everybody has to compartmentalize him, her, themselves to um, to fight against the division that is mm. going on currently again, and especially in the States, I think it's really, really frightening. So one needs yeah. to make a stand. But it is a shame that one has to make a stand at all. I mean, I'm more than that. Yeah, mm. and everyone who is is more, and we're all very different. This is, is very different to have a kind of cohesive community that says, we are all pansies and so on. So, but but I think also that a lot of men who are, are not living as a gay gay man have the experience of being bullied. Yeah. So um, that is. Um, that I want to keep my work open for everyone who wants to step in, and, and I've put a few things from from alchemical old imagery into um, to, to, to contextualize it or however that came to my mind. Yeah. Mm. Can you talk about that a bit, about how you incorporate alchemy into your work? Um, I'm for a long time now, I think for 12 years or longer, really fascinated by uh, chemical imagery from um, Renaissance times. So they are painted around 1550, but it goes on then into early Baroque as well. It was a um, flourishing time for people who came up with alternative models to Christianity in the West. And um, it, it is actually really interesting stuff. These um, images, they play around with gender fluidity, with um, a man in order to have, to, to gain really um, kingship. Yeah, the, the position of being a believable king has to be when he's able to stand on the moon, which is of course a feminine, so-called feminine symbol. And also for the woman, she has to stand on the sun. And in between is a hermaphroditic, hermaphroditic uh, face, an androgynous face, where you have got one body with uh, two genitals and two heads. And um, it, 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 is, it has been used in surrealism, of course. But um, for, for me, it is more about the, um, uh, how to say, the um, as humans, we can... We, we live through imagination. We can model in our imagination all kinds of stuff, and it's all real. And this is also how we construct our everyday life, through fantasies and helplessly being uh, p- um, beings that, that uh, argue with each other, projecting onto each other. It's, it's so much about imagination and our, all our attempts to have this really grounded into science and so on, is all very fragile. So what I do is I take some of these images, um, scan them, um, and, and uh, dissect them into different fragments and so on, and change the color values and project them onto a new canvas. But, I mean, what I didn't want to do is to repeat alchemical Images. I have a little bit repeated on this one here by quoting the snake thing, the Ur, mm. so-called Ur, the snake that bites in its own tail. I mean, basically a symbol of eternity. And, and that's um, an echoing green you're pointing to. Transformation. Yeah. And um, um, yeah, so, so the alchemical images play for me a role of research because I find fascinating how they did it. And uh, in the same time, also to just um, chop them up 
and be irreverent with them and use them knowing what these guys, how beautiful they are. I mean, this is not not being um, nasty to these images. It's yeah. more using their potential and knowing that I, I'm, I'm connecting with them, but I need to do it in a contemporary way. So I mm -hmm. want to find about new ways of speaking about this clash of my my everyday mind, my rationality, my reason with this subconscious or what we call subterranean forces. Black Sun, for example. Is it okay when I go into this briefly? Because it's Yes, yes, in. please. I would love to talk about Black Black Sun is um, <coughs> one of your large scale paintings uh on canvas or on linen yeah. uh in the show and uh part of the title. <laughs> An inspiration yeah. for the title. So Black Sun is um I mean when I say the clash between reason and those elements in us, we can't Harness. I mean, imagination and all the images we have about this, it's subterranean, it's hell, it's kind of deep, deep cellars and so forth. Um, this is in mythology often used for um, descent into the underworld. Mm -hmm. And um, a I mean, the, the, one of the earliest things we know is, or one of the most prominent one is the story of Osiris, the god, I mean, the god of the pharaohs, but also the god of vegetation. So he has to go into the underworld for 12 hours and has to get uh, on his dark boat protected, but also challenged in the darkness in order to come out and be received by the goddess of dawn, um, uh, which is in, in uh, I mean, associated in ancient history with Venus. Mm -hmm. um, so, so he is greeted by by the goddess of dawn into the new day. So, I mean, this is the the earliest form of of the descent into the underworld in order to come up with something new and something that, in his power position, there is a king, some, something meaningful. But you have the same for Persephone and for for the feminine role, and the same for Psyche. They need to go into the darkness in order to mature or to come up with uh, something important. Then we mm -hmm. have got um, Orpheus, of course, as an art role model for the artist. Cy Twombly has done a lot of about Orpheus and in connection with the poems of Rilke. And um, uh, I found that in the in alchemy, it's this, the, the image of the black sun. So the sun goes down into the earth. It's a very primitive interpretation of this. Yeah. The sun, the sun um, set. But it's it's maybe not primitive. It's it's just very literal. One can imagine it appears in when, when, you don't, when you don't know how the earth is shaped and so on. And I like the kind of poetry of it. Yeah. Um, so the the sun blackens, and this is in the um, in in alchemy an image of um, uh, the being being in contact with really inferior elements in oneself that mm. are like mud, like depression, like really difficult, dark stuff, and um, or grief, mm. for example, as well. Yeah, and uh, to. Um, to know, because this is the ultimate knowledge, that in the darkness there is that spark that will illuminate the sun in the end. But it needs to go through this purification process, through these processes again and again and again, till it comes to a point where um, a kind of new life force is regained. In alchemy, this is then the red sun in the end. So in this black sun, there is a, a this was my way of... Um, being almost spiritual, but I had to do this because I thought the last winter had such a a, a really um, heavy atmosphere mm -hmm. around for lots of people. I know, I mean, including Absolutely. yourself. Absolutely, yes, I know. I think it was a rough winter for a lot of us, and I don't know what it was about this particular uh, winter, but I I know everybody. <laughs> so many people struggled, and I think we've all struggled in the past, you know, yeah. three years. Um, you know, there's this, been a uh, lot of darkness that we've had lockdown, to come through. Yeah, lockdown and and also what's politically going on does sometimes mm. um, make me very um, sad, and I think, or sad, or uh, actually, actually, it makes me angry. Yeah. And um, um, 
yeah, th this is how the black sun came to pass. And I mm -hmm. thought I need to be maybe quite literal here to have this um, circle, I mean, to, to have this uh, circle on my painting, which mm -hmm. I have then continued in the echoing green. There's a circle yeah. in us, I introduced this new thing, the green thing. And it's in the same side of the canvas and it is yeah. a bit of an echo, yeah. It plays, it plays with uh, being being on another level because I, I wanted to, again, with this painting, it's, it's important to keep the um, it, 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 the dark side in, in the new as well alive. Like in mm. the black sun, there's also something going on on the other side with light and with some energy, with this fire. And um, uh, so, so I, I, I want to have this life energy always present somehow wherever yeah. it is. I think it really comes through in your work. There's always uh, that spark that you see kind of blazing through, whether it's in the background or, or kind of just a spark through, you know, uh, if it's Absolutely. a darker piece, it's, it's a spark of light that comes through. I mean, I don't want to um, be too, uh, because it, it, it might sound sentimental or so, but I mean it really. Uh, I think that, um, that there is a lot of very, very, very difficult stuff going on. For a lot of people, but I find it also uh, important to keep somehow or to to mediate some hope. I mean, yes. to have something positive uh, around and something transformative. I believe that in, uh, or I feel it's not believing; it's it's knowing that in these uh, these transformative phases, like I came, I came as, they talk about transformation basically. Yeah, to, from from dark through process into something else, mm -hmm. and it's not that it remains and oh fantastic hippie, it's uh, everything is fine. It's just in a continuous movement of becoming, for that. Right. So the becoming is this kind of inter interwined um, uh, polarity idea, yin yang, and however one ever wants to call it. Yeah. So um, this this would be uh, in a nutshell, I think. Yeah, I um. I want to hear a bit more about how um, how well there there are two things how your work has changed and evolved since that very beginning in your early twenties and um, what do you think the most significant uh, marker was for you and that or milestone um, was for you in that change or difference in your work um, and then also. How do you think it's changed since the last three years, as the, as we've gone through this pandemic, and um, and, okay. and how that's worked for you, or changed your work? I mean, due to my age, this is a long thing, so I make it short. <laughs> You're very young, very young. <laughs> okay, so um, uh, it it started uh, clumsy. Uh, clumsy but true true somehow it, it felt for me true I didn't show people uh, I, I started to show them at a later point and mm. I had my sister-in-law who was an artist who was somehow um, really like uh, my mentor and she believed always in me she had always the feeling I have to say something so uh, when I when I was at my worst and showed her and, and thought this is all really horrible and um unskillful and so on. She said, oh, this, uh, do, do you have got something there? You just go on, do it, do it, do it, which I did. Mm. So um, I developed this uh, kind of, what is kind of maybe called surreal mm. language, but it is, I've never identified with surrealism. For me, surrealism is too, um, too precious on some level and too mm. much... Uh, engaged with having women as their muses and I find they mm. functionalize the feminine and women mm. and um, uh, it, it, it's for me too dogmatic so I've got uh, also I was called are you surrealistic and I said well, uh, no no um, <laughs> anyway <laughs> so, uh, but uh, what, what I felt uh, no I liked more uh, at that point I liked artists like Max Beckman and Jean Dubuffet Mm -hmm. And uh, Antonin Artaud, I liked, um, where there was something um, quite primal and quite mm -hmm. uh, distressed in, in their work as well, which which I, I mean, Beckman, of course, is highly developed. But his mythological paintings are really amazing. I find, mm -hmm. I find them still, his last works, these uh, uh, triptychs, they are just really uh, wonderful. 
Um, so, so I developed a certain, um, I, I think I, I was okay with myself. So after maybe 10 years, I could, I could formulate what I, um, more what I had in mind. But my, um, the, the real important point was the decision to do my MA and to have a fantastic supervisor, Beth Harlan. And I said to her, I come here in order to break my habits as a painter. And she said, great, that is exactly what we want to do with you. And um, can, can you find something or paintings where you reflect, where you can see a reflection of your own work? And this was, then I found the alchemical pictures. Okay, okay. So this is how I got there. And um, from, uh, I, I started first of all to make photocopies of some really big ones and um, cut them apart and made collages, which are actually quite nice. But mm. um, then I digitalized the whole process. And um, how did when, you? So how did you do that then? Yeah, to scan an image and to go in, in Photoshop and to cut it into segments. Okay. change colors, make a collage out of them and use the collage as a springboard for a projection. Got it. Yeah. Um, and uh, elements of this I still use. I mean, elements of this process, but I'm, uh, I am I got into this very easily. I mean, this is, mm -hmm. as, as soon as I found these images, I thought, this is, they, they, these guys had the same in mind, but they did it very differently. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, I can see that colleagues work with alchemy, other painters, um, sometimes very literal by quoting. Um, th this is th this is somehow the breaking point was for me, um, my um, allowing um, to contextualize my work more. Mm -hmm. Okay, and um, and you regarding the also, last three years. Yeah, it did uh, initially, and, and maybe it's uncomfortable to hear this, but for me it was really important to uh, be forced to be uh, really silent, and I really enjoyed that. Yeah. Uh, uh, it, it did my I've heard uh, that from a lot of people, actually. I I felt I really bad about it, but... good about the silence of it, yeah. Yeah, the silence and also uh, to be, I mean, I made one painting that um, um, I think you have got in the gallery as well, it's, called One Day, One Night, One Evening, uh, something like that. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. It, 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 it was the feeling of um, having having a greater contact to a bigger picture through mm -hmm. COVID. It, it, not, not, not only this quite, I mean, I was very, uh, had to do a lot before constantly and with shows and things I had to do and deadlines and so on. And I, I was really glad that this had all gone and that at last time to, go deeper into the subject that really interests me. Mm. And um, uh, then then we had our contact as well. And um, that gave, this gives me also more space to um, to say, okay, just do it. And um, <laughs> and it, um, it, it, it's a cooperation like this. It is very helpful for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, lockdown was for me a, uh, a, a good reminder of of something and I think for, for me as an artist I need a lot of introversion and silence mm -hmm. um, these research elements and, and thinking about stuff, feeling into it and I mean this this unit of thinking, feeling and intuition this I think is very important and the material bit comes, I mean the four elements if you like, yeah, they come together mm -hmm. like that it sounds like the painting process for you is so, um, like it's almost meditative and, um, and it sounds like it's very cathartic. <laughs> like the, when yeah, you yeah. finish a work, is it just like, Oh, done. <laughs> That's it. It. <laughs> I know when, 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 uh, it, it, it's like, uh, probably when one works out as well, there's effect, there is a kind of effect of happiness. And um, when when I have finished the work, and sometimes difficult to know when, mm. uh, the let's say the signpost or the pointer for me is this feeling of ah, oh, there is something I, I feel really I feel that mm -hmm. that feels right, 
So I, I don't try too much, um, but it comes always with formal aspects as well. That there are there is some balance not achieved or something like that. But yeah, it is. It can be uh, cathartic when I recognize what it's about because in the beginning I never know what it's about. Yeah. And even when I plan something, it's different. So it comes up as you're working. Yeah, it comes up when I work, and this with with this Penzi subject was for me very interesting because I thought. Okay, something in me wants that to be on the canvas and to be communicated to the outside. Mm -hmm. And then I thought, mm, can I do this? Is this too personal or not? And I thought, no, it's actually feelings of many people to be yeah. a sensitive child. I think we connect most with the paintings that were the most, you know, came from the most vulnerable places and the artists yeah, yeah. Um, or, you know, or the dancers or the musicians or, you know, any creative cr making work, um, yeah. that place of vulnerability really creates and uh, this much more approachable end result. So. Yes. Uh, and I hope that in my work that comes across anyway, whether I say something about it or not. Um, uh, be because I think uh, in, in my drawings, for example, I, I really think I cultivate that to go very much. These this, uh, color pencils, they, they have such a wonderful, um, how to say, they, they yield to, to really energy. Mm -hmm. They emphasize um, uh, what I want them to do. They are wonderful with that. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so, so to follow really a line and let this life of this line being be there and leave it there like it is. Mm -hmm. I think it's also something Twombly said, who I, by the way, admire greatly, um, that, uh, that that a line, that to, to do the line for its own life, something like this in the lines. Mm -hmm. I, I, um, especially in drawing, I think this is a different, um, a little bit of a different medium for me than painting. So therefore mm -hmm. my drawing they look different. There, there's yeah. more emptiness, and the line has much more um, presence than in a painting. There's um, there's a lot more space, a lot more breathing room in your drawings on paper. Yeah. Um, I love the emptiness of the paper often, and um, and then there's a frenetic energy in some of the uh, in the in the drawing and painting pieces yeah. works. Um, and I think that is the energy. It just, it's so interesting, the drawings versus the paintings because they both have energy and, and these moving qualities to them. Um, but there's that special quality of that white space surrounding the, the works on paper where you just give us the space to enjoy the, the quick burst of energy that happens. Um, I think it's really special. Thank you. I feel that um, uh, looking at Asian art, classical mm. Asian art, has um, uh, had an influence on that, but also um, the, the so-called informal, it's called informal, it's an uh, art movement in the 1980s. Mm. And my sister-in-law, she made drawings that were, I mean, they're very different, but they leave this space. And I, I had a, um, I went to a show about American drawings that was in Frankfurt in the 19, early 1980s. So mm -hmm. when I was just really into becoming an artist. And I loved that work, these works because there was so much uh, about empty space. I mean, especially it's from this stuff again. So... Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and also about in, in classical drawing um, the, uh, the the fine pressure that is used for charcoal or for uh, sanguine especially the, mm -hmm. the reddish drawings um, that um, people like Watteau and um, also Boucher I mean he's despised for his paintings but look at these yeah. wonderful drawings yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think um, I want to go back to um, how your works can sometimes initially appear abstract, yep. and and then you know <clears throat> all of a sudden you look, take a closer look, and there are these little figures and these little marks 
that you've made and and structures kind of emerging like buildings and um and so could you discuss the process of creating uh these hidden elements of of your work i I mean it sounds like the cutouts from the alchemy um you you know alchemical uh pieces that you're building into the work um might be part of it that you already described but no, it's it's a uh, uh, it, it, it's. I think it comes from what I was talking about earlier about. Mm-hmm. Uh, I I loved to hide stuff as a child, uh, yeah. and um and to and and to find things. Mm-hmm. So uh, I was always somehow in in a, a garden, looking for things in the earth or in uh, in in a shrub and things like this, and I hoped always to find something beautiful or something of interest which I would collect then and uh, it, it's a on, on another level it's a kind of obstinacy on my on my part that I don't believe in the division between abstract and figurative I find this silly to be honest yeah. but um, okay this is just my opinion yeah, yeah. so um, it is here in England it, it, or it has been, um, it, it was very formative to people to say, I'm going abstract. And I thought, why would I, why should I have to go abstract if I don't want that? And I like to play with this, I mean, with both. I like to to um, to surprise myself when I paint it and to mm-hmm. not to be bored. I love paintings where I can discover things, mm. where, where I can, um, where pe- somebody has, taking the time to put a little detail in that can be discovered. I mean, somebody like John Martin, the Scottish painter who did this apocalyptic landscape, which I've just seen when I was in Newcastle, actually. Oh, in yeah. The museum. yeah. It was really good because I know them from reproductions, but um, they are, they are, um, they are of course, really over the top and so on, but they have got in, 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 in this really big scale, tiny elements, little horses, people doing this, people doing that. Also buildings falling apart. Um, I felt, ah, oh, somebody had that done before. I feel that these things falling apart, this is when certain concepts in life that don't work out. Mm. And uh, I think this is currently happening for a lot of people. It's like a, a, when, when dreams break, and yeah. which is... Um, in the same time that something else rises out, something new. Um, uh, so it's and the concept it's, of it has to break sometimes for that new thing to come out of the like the phoenix rising kind of. <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, yeah. I've recently run a workshop, and this subject of the phoenix came up because in that room was a big phoenix. Yes. Um, and uh, maybe I briefly say this now again because I think it's important. Also with the dawn and so on. I think it's really important to see the difference between, I mean, that approach I have, which comes very much from a consciousness of uh, experience of uh, um, uh, working with minor things, not with major concepts and so on, but with with small things. Because in political movements, the dawn and um, breaking the the, the phoenix rising is often coming from uh, um, the the right. Mm. And... um, uh, i.e. to break society down and then nationalism comes through and um, right. purity comes through and um, the supremacy of race comes through and so on. This is nothing to do on any level with, with this, what I'm talking about. This is not right. about um, purification process. It's about being conscious about this intertwining of 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 the difficult, I mean, this rubbing, this friction that is everywhere going on. And it has yeah. its own beauty, but it, it it's a problem. No, I'm glad you said that, and I think it's important to, um, think especially it's these days, right. you know, with such a, a resurgence of the extreme right. Yeah, um, exactly. I think it's really important to clarify um, these things and and to, I mean, the extremists yeah, I, always bastardize these concepts, don't they? Yeah, <laughs> so and, uh, yeah. I mean, therefore, uh, I mean, these are the purity and stuff like this. this these are concepts that are um, that are completely imbalanced and false and inhuman. Yeah. So, uh, but the awareness, I think, what what I, I try to um, do with these ideas, because these ideas that I find 
there, there are visual ideas as well that I've seen, discovered, like many others as well. But they, they have got a potential that one can use for something that is in reality about, about being human. I mean, on a very mm. basic level, you know, to have to to, um, to to fight with grief, with death. Mm-hmm. I mean, to embrace love, all of these things that mm. I try in reality to, to um, work about. Yeah, These are the subjects I'm, I'm thinking about. Very, very simple. Yeah. Um, the simplest are sometimes the most complex, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and it's, it's right. like, um, yeah, yeah. And every generation does it in a different way. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so I have some more questions. Where should I? Where should I go next? <laughs> uh, Follow your eyes. I will. <laughs> okay, here's a fun one. If you could have any superpower as an artist, what would it be and how would it affect your artwork? <laughs> um, I would uh, I would paint much bigger sizes. <laughs> <laughs> really uh, long arms. <laughs> I, I, I would have a kind of superpower to extend my body. I mean, to make it um, a longer arms, longer, longer body all, all in all and, and um, have really big brushes that can also um, shrink and get very fine for detail. <laughs> Something like that would be a good one. <laughs> I, would go, I would go for really big paintings. Yeah, yeah. So, so that would require like superhuman extensions on the yeah, arms. Yeah, because yeah, I have to be on the ladder, <laughs> and I, um, I find from somewhere from one eighty or two meters onwards, which is summer six foot seven foot it gets um a bit awkward and um i have to go to the chiropractor (laughs) (laughs) oh god okay yeah yeah okay well that's a fun one um (laughs) and um so i i think a lot of artists especially would be interested in hearing how you made the transition and or just how you um bit the bullet and said, I'm a full-time artist. This is my job. This is how I make money. This is the work I do. Um, and, you know, yes, there will be things here and there that supplement that work, but how uh, I think that artists especially would be interested in hearing about that. Okay, I, I mean, I worked as a psychotherapist, as I said, and uh, run workshops mm-hmm. uh, that would um, focus on a kind of combination of psychological elements and um, painting from within, i.e. Uh, the body-mind. Uh, so what I decided, I, I, I had the feeling that I came to the end of my shelf life. After 14 years, I thought I need to, um, I, I've done that. I, I It doesn't feel genuine anymore, so I need to really let go. And I prepared my... Um, clients early enough it was really important to give everyone a kind of deadline and say this is when I will stop and um, with my partner together and with another income I have um, that was possible Mm -hmm. but um, of course it got me in a I mean I did instant I I, I had uh, stopped working as a psychotherapist and did my academic training Mm -hmm. so for three I mean, all in all, four years. And um, I mean, it's MA and PhD and so on. So, uh, and afterwards, uh, it, it was very much to get myself out there. I, I got a, this um, Abbey Fellowship Award, which is a very, very good award, which mm-hmm. came with three months in Rome at the British School at Rome. So, um, where I could develop my, my drawings and um, I thought uh, after this, I I bet you, doors open for me, which they didn't. Um, And that was a hard process for me to learn. To uh, become more and more uh, independent and on on some level, I mean, independent of, uh, I I think with this friction of not succeeding, which I had um, a long time in my life, really. Mm -hmm. As an artist, I've had a long time not seen 
and um, the, and I think it was necessary for me as an artist mm. to uh, to really um, develop in the way I needed to to have my own language. I, I would say um, that that I can access my language relatively easily. I get sometimes mm. quibbles like everyone else as well, but um, there was a, a kind of I mean, when we met, this was a strange, I mean, the, 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 basically to work with a gallery was something I, I really wanted, but it didn't come up. So once, once I had a colleague who had a gallerist and it was a very bad experience and mm. um, I, I was a bit uh, careful from then and I had also funny encounters with galleries. So I thought, um, so I, I, um, participated with other people in research projects and also in shows where we had to put some money in sometimes. Mm. Even good shows, really good ones with catalog and everything, but we had to pay for it. Mm. And we took each time the risk, or I took the risk saying I, I will sell something, and sometimes I did. And um, it gets me out there and somebody will see me and blah, blah. And um, so I did this. And at some point, and this was in 21, um, I, I thought so, and this I had organized a wonderful solo show for myself where I didn't have to paint. Was in an old bunker. Yeah. Um, the grey walls were fantastic. I mean, this yeah. grey concrete for my kind of work, which is very colorful and um, needs neutral background always. Mm -hmm. um, that was ideal, and uh, I could show a really big work. So I was very happy with this. But internally, I said, "This is the last show I do." I've got enough of it. I'm tired from having to put all this energy. And then we had the contact suddenly. And then we met. So, <laughs> but in, oh. almost, in the moment when I say, okay, I had it, something else comes up. I found this really, really amazing. Yeah. It's always said, it is amazing. Um, has to let go to, uh, to have something new coming up. And I think, oh, this is all just talk, talk, talk. Um, because, uh, but, but then I didn't think about letting go. I just thought I've got enough of it. I was really angry at the situation of having mm. to pay into, and people come always, of course, for free. I mean, musicians normally say they get even a ticket sale or whatever, but as an artist, yeah. expect to be glad to be uh, able to show something at all. And I find this uh, is wrong. I find mm. the institution, I mean, how artists are treated in society is not right. Yeah. Um, I agree. Uh, in Holland, for example, artists have got a kind of income because they work on some subjects that are of a societal nature, which is true, isn't it? So, mm. yeah, yeah, this I is how I did this. But it was a risk. And um, but for example, to 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 close the chapter of working as a psychotherapist was very good for me. Yeah, mm. and I had the feeling. I hope I have done it well the 14 years I worked with people and um, so so uh, and and to engage with people and to that has been always very close to me I mean I'm, I'm I, I like to have a discussion uh, I mean about this was the reason why I thought it's also okay to have an interview like like today yeah. to um I, I don't do this only for me and nobody is allowed to see this. It's, it, it is a communication, I think. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, well, I'm really glad that that door did not close and that we met. <laughs> but I think it's really interesting for other artists to hear because I think that, um, you know, it's, it's hard being an artist. You know, yeah, I, uh, my background was a dancer and, you yeah. know, you put, all of these hours into rehearsal and getting your body to be this like major machine that has this incredible muscle memory and can perform and work and never take a break. And, and in fact, taking a break isn't, you know, great for your, you know, the practice of it. And then you finally have these performances and, and, you know, my experience was dancers don't really get paid much for performing, um, <laughs> if at all. And, um, you know, and there are a lot of people who have to self-produce, like you said. And yeah. so it was very disheartening for me um, as a performing artist. And, um, and I think a lot of artists, you know, they're on one hand, they want to take the leap 
Um, but on the other hand, they always need to have some sort of um, something generating income if yeah. they're not always selling. And artists, even the best selling artists, don't always sell. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so I was I was, uh, I was quite lucky in in that regard. But um, I want to uh, to to have my in income through my art as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, when when you say the doors closed, I didn't want to stop painting, but I did want right. to. I thought I do it just for myself and yeah. uh, leave it and uh, they can sort it out when I'm gone then. So something like this. Yeah. 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 No, no, it is, uh, I, I think, but often, often they, they, it opens up a path for people to do it. Mm. Yeah. I, yeah. That's true. I think sometimes you have to take that leap to, to open up that, um, that path, like you said. And, um, and you never know what's going to happen. But I think the most important thing, what I've observed with artists and um, you know, with dancers, with painters, with all types of different artists um, over my years, I've noticed that the people who really stay focused and keep the practice going, keep the work going, even if it's just for themselves, you know, and not putting it out there all the time, but the practice of doing it every day or as often as they need to and just never giving up and staying focused and being consistent that is what seems to really um drive the most successful artists even if it takes some long period of time so, uh, i think on in, in my development what uh, during the development i felt it was distressing to me that i uh, i thought you should paint like more um, like it's done today and to, to, to go, do it like so and so and like so and so. And um, in me, there is something that absolutely says no. Mm -hmm. So I have to do it in, in this particular way, which I have uh, a bit described earlier on. And uh, so, I, I mean, in hindsight, I think this helped me really not to, not to, um, cater for the zeitgeist in a way mm -hmm. or not try to cater for the zeitgeist yeah mm -hmm. um because uh or, or to do something um that is not really felt but for me that was really important that i need to feel these things and that it has got something uh, uh I, I don't know how to say it yeah but it is something that needs to be genuine maybe something like that yeah yeah, it has to. Yeah, it has to come from an authentic place, right? Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Difficult, but no authentic. We never know when when is what authentic. But yeah, I, I, I get <laughs> uh, there's a lot of disturbance around as well. Mm. So, um, but but it was for me. Um, it's, sometimes I thought, oh, you're really you're really stupid that you don't do something lighter and um, just just to uh, get a few. Um, things off the staple and so on. It didn't work. Mm. So in, in hindsight, it's just how I am. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think it's interesting because your work has been collected by, you know, institutions, um, yeah. private collectors, and even via interior designers um, who specify their, you know, your work for their clients, um, which is a really good sign of wide appeal, but also, um, is is that kind of approachability or um, kind of placement? I, I think you know because it can be so um, emotional. Um, you mean my work? Yes, work. your work. It can be so emotional that um, you know. I think it's great that it could even be. Um, accessed by people who are placing work for other people, you know, like an interior yeah, designer or something yeah. like that. Um, how does that make you feel with, with how you well, want I've, to be? I have got for years one collector who has got paintings that were very difficult to look at. Mm -hmm. And she loved them. And I mm -hmm. thought, how weird that something that I felt, can I show that? I mean, each time when, uh, for example, the Black Sun, I thought, I can't show that painting. And then you you kind of said, oh, I love this painting. <laughs> I thought, okay. Um, obviously, I'm I'm sometimes uh, not aware of that 
people want actually to see something that has got depth. Yeah, yeah, depth or, or severity or almost. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't catch that. Almost like a severity or a, a darkness yeah. to it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I try always to get something in that makes it, it balances it a bit out. Mm -hmm. But uh, so I'm, I'm. Uh, it, it did encourage me actually a lot. Also, when when I got um, the from from the uh, I'm even from an interior designer that kind of endorsement. So I, I thought, okay, I know I haven't done this just in order to have four squares together also and yeah. they look very pretty on a wall yeah. but um but also this can look very good so it's not um i don't want to rewrite anything here mm. <clears throat> but it was for me it was a kind of it surprised me mm. it's the honest answer um and i think but, we touched on this uh, sorry go ahead i said but then not because i i have a very um, I, I try to bring beauty in my work as well. Yeah. So uh, yeah. this might, might be what what is recognized as well. As well I think be, as some, as something that is uh, uh, has got some errors in there as well. Yeah. 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 Mm. I find your work very beautiful. I think there's um, there is a sweeping. I I keep on coming back to the movement, but some some of the sweeping motions in your work. Uh, are just breathtaking and it's and the palettes. I, I love the palettes you work with. Okay. Um, <laughs> so um, I think we touched on this before, but uh, and you briefly mentioned it. Um, but if your artwork could talk, what do you think it would say about you as an artist to the oh, viewer? Do you really want to come out there? <laughs> or what secrets would you <laughs> would tell? I would say, I would say <laughs> you're quite intense. <laughs> um, there's a lot of love. Uh, um, there's a lot of resilience and uh, quite quirky. I think this is what I would say. Yeah, I've never posed myself that question. Though. Thank you for it. it. Was a bit embarrassing, but fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have to get to the good stuff, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think I I I feel all of those things in your work. So I think um, I think that's a really good answer. <laughs> um, <laughs> it really does reflect, you know, the. You have like a very genuine, uh, loving presence, um, and our few times that we've gotten to really spend time together, um, you know, I I I get that, and I think that comes through. Often I think work. we do match each other there definitely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh. Well, I um, is there anything else that you'd like to add uh, before we? Head out. <laughs> uh, I, I would like to add that I'm uh, really very happy uh, working with you as a gallerist. <laughs> Thank you for your, saying that. Yeah, because of you, I, I feel really understood by you. And that is not, um, how to say, that is not, uh, uh, how to say, um, it's special, it's special. So thank you for that. Oh, thank you. Thank you for saying that. That's really lovely to hear. Yeah. Um, and yeah. I think this is a good team we've got here. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, thank you so much for taking the time uh, to sit down and chat about your work. And um, and please, please, anybody listening, watching, please check out Marius's exhibition at jensingergallery.com forward slash black sun. Um, one of the paintings we spoke out spoke about today. Um, so yeah, thank you so much, Marius. Thank you so much for inviting me. Okay, that's a wrap. Thank you so much for joining me today for this pre-season episode of The Gallery Date. I hope you enjoyed the interview with Marius and I hope you'll check out his exhibition. You could do a virtual walk walkthrough of the full show. Um, it's on jensingergallery.com forward slash black sun. Um, and please send an email to info at jensingergallery.com and leave your feedback. And I'd love to hear from you. All right, I'll see you soon.